And I think we will um, have the panel discussion based on questions from the room. And I don't know if there are, have been any questions from the, uh, from the web, yes? Hello, my name is uh, Milka from Kenya International Livestock Research Institute. And um, I have two questions. The first one goes to Matthew. Uh, you talked about joining the dots, and it's really interesting to see you have models that have been able to show uh, the relationship between pathogen, host, and environment. But my question is on applicability of these models in areas where uh, you are not able to control, say, the animal movement, like where I'm from. The, the, we have nomadic tribes where they move around in, with their animals and it's really hard to trace. So do you, have you incorporated such problems within the models that you have? And how does this affect the predictive uh, ability of the model? Then the second question goes to Jan, uh, the fourth speaker. You talked about the relationship between the host and the parasite, and it's really interesting to see that uh, you, the, the localization of the parasite within the host affects even the acuteness of the disease. So in a general way, how does your work advise vaccine developers and uh, maybe drug, people who are in uh, drug development uh, research, because this is really interesting. Thank you. Okay, I'll answer the uh, first question if I can. Uh, thanks very much for it. Um, the modeling that I think you're referring to, such as the, uh, the disease modeling, but those simulations that I showed, uh, benefits from the fact that we record all those movements in the UK, certainly for our farm animals. Um, in fact, there is an issue that we face, which is potentially the infection of some wild animals with the same virus, and we, we don't include that, I guess, because we can't. Um, in a situation where that information simply isn't available, then it's quite possible to produce uh, models which, which, which work, uh, but without taking into account the explicit movements. So sim as we have done with our vectors, just allowing them to spread and for example, the original models for uh, foot and mouth disease in the UK were like that. They didn't take account of actual movements, they just allowed the virus to spread through farms uh, in some way or other. So it's a shortcut, um, and it's not one that I like, and so in our case, because we have the data, we use it. In another situation where it's not possible, a different, simpler type of model would be required. The second question, I think, I'm not sure what I was trying to say informs the vaccine developer. What I believe are the implications of at least what I was trying to say for risk analysis and management is that uh, there are good reasons to think uh, of rather than bio-exclusion, think of living with the, mic with the microbes, and there I mean that we can create livestock husbandry conditions that just do not breed these aggressive viruses and bacteria. I believe that's the main point, thanks. Thank you, there's another question over there. May I ask you in the audience uh, to think about framing your questions in the light of the drivers of the emerging risks? So we get a discussion on, on which covers maybe more than one detail. So if possible, please. Okay, I'll try to do that. My name's John West from Rothamsted Research. Um, but my question's more to do with helping to control outbreaks and um, the idea of inoculating livestock uh, to render immunity when there is an outbreak uh, occurring at maybe a one part of a, a territory. Um, usually there's a reluctance to do that because it then makes it hard to monitor whether uh, a disease has actually been successfully controlled because all the inoculated livestock would have uh, antibodies to, to that disease. Um, but 
I wonder if any of the panel know whether there's uh, alternative diagnostic methods that could now be used to check whether um, a pathogen has actually been successfully controlled while still enabling the livestock population to be inoculated to, to render immunity. So is that now making inoculation a, a possibility for the future? Who wants to answer to that question? Um, I can't answer from the animal perspective, but if we draw correlates with human disease, then clearly we, we are a, we're beginning to be able, and particularly with the new molecular diagnostic techniques, to identify whether infection is by a wild-type virus or a vaccine-related virus. So whether there's that potential with animals. I'm not sure whether we're talking about serology sometime after the event, whether that's going to be possible. And I don't know if we have anybody with a more laboratory-based expertise that would be able to answer that. But, uh, you know, in, in human disease, we, we do differentiate between wild-type and vaccine-related infection. I don't have the lab expertise, but, I mean, a general comment. Obviously, there's a lot of progress with the development of uh, DIVA vaccines, I mean vaccines that uh, can be distinguished from uh, live infection in terms of the antibody that they generate. But I do think there's lots of issues over their use in the event of a, let's say, significant disease outbreak, such as uh, knowing that the animal you're vaccinating, thinking is uninfected, is not currently infected, and, uh, and simply the movements around farms. So foot and mouth in the UK in 2001, the last thing we would have wanted is thousands of vaccinators going out or going from farm to farm. So yes, I'm sure one day there'll be lots of good examples of deeper vaccines in use, but I think there's also some dangers uh, still to be faced. Yeah, and I just would like to add that um, in addition to the DIVA solution, which is to differentiate between vaccinates and naturally exposed, you know, the approach of vaccines in the first place is a very um, developed world, rich country kind of thinking that we would like to spread out across the world. So making a vaccine is challenging, but making an effective vaccination program is very challenging. And so the world, you know, we ha we're so used to it in the human populations because we think of childhood diseases and we get vaccinated once and we kind of have lifelong immunity. Maybe you get a booster when you're older. Um, in some cases, and we, our turnover rate is set up, you know, so we can vaccinate children because we know where they are. With the animal world, you, know, you have this rapid turnover. So we just saw it in, um, in Liberia now with Pesta de Petit Ruminant, and they had a massive campaign for vaccination three years ago and vaccinated every animal in the country. That took a lot of effort. You think about vaccinating every animal in a small, tiny country, even. Um, and then three years later, 80%, 70% of the animal population is naive again because they have babies every year and they have another set of babies the next year. And so maintaining good vaccination campaigns for every species, for every disease, um, starts to make us question about is that approach, and it gets back into what Jan was saying, is there a different approach where we have more resistant or tolerant animals? Um, so we can focus vaccines just on a number of diseases because the scale of thinking about vaccinating every animal and person for two or three hundred diseases um, that are possible is really, you know, gets beyond comprehension. If I may throw in a quick comment, at the peak of the H5N1 endemic in Asia, China was vaccinating chicken with influenza vaccine using applying over 16 and a half billion doses every year and yet at the same time there was uh, no more virus diversity of influenza poultry viruses in China. Thank you very much for this uh, good feedback on that question. I think we can take another question or perhaps on the same question There's over there. I think uh, I was first. Who? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning and congratulations to all the speakers because uh, the, the morning was really, really interesting. I'm Miguel Miranda, entomologist from the University of the Bavaria Islands. 
and currently member as well of the AHO panel. Well, my question is not, is not uh, for any of you, but for all of you. And it is related with the, with the link you show between the vector bone diseases and one of the most important, apparently, drivers, which is the landscape change. So my question is, do you, do you know any real case where really the assessment of vector bone diseases of vectors are implemented on the policies that are regulating the use of the land? Sorry. Um, uh, it's the question that came through the website from Alessandro Broly. I don't know if he's here or watching on the webcast. He's an EFSA scientist. Um, and he refers to um, Bill Kalesh's uh, first presentation when he, he says uh, he used the example of, uh, he talked about land change um, being a driver um, for emerging disease and used the example of palm oil, uh, which, as we know, is massively cultivated because it's one of the cheapest fat matrices available for food and other purposes. And he says, um, w why are we not considering the costs of the risks um, incurred from e emerging diseases um, in the cost-benefit analysis when permission is granted for forests to be logged, for example, for palm plantation? When we factor in things such as um, deaths from Ebola, then palm oil suddenly isn't such a cheap product. Um, why should society pay for that? And if we have data supporting this evidence, why is the, the trend not changing? Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for those questions, please, Bill. You can start. Yeah, so maybe I can capture those two at the same time. Um, I think there is starting to become some data where um, there's successful programs, of course. It's like anything in public health or veterinary medicine. You don't hear about the success stories because there's no disease and there's no outbreak. So we don't have a lot of case studies on those. So several speakers have kind of referred to that uh, dilemma, um, even with the horizon scanning. If you're good at it, then no, you don't get no credit. Um, but there are examples. I know in Costa Rica, the public health department is seeing increases in malaria. So that's very well documented with deforestation or logging. And the Ministry of Forestry generates huge amounts of revenues um, based on the logging industry, the the lumber industry, and the Ministry of Health bears the burden of the cost on malaria control because there's a clear relationship is as you open up forest and people move in, you get more human malaria. But the finance ministry has never pulled those together, which answers the second question, um, to say what does it cost the country? So one group is making a lot of money, another group is paying a lot of taxpayer other money from revenues. Is it effective? And where that's been looked at well is in, um, in Brazil, with deforestation in Brazil, when you look at the cost-benefit ratio of deforestation without the cost of diseases, um, they've actually already exceeded uh, the cost-benefit ratio just without diseases. But when you add in the cost of infectious diseases with the deforestation, the, the absolute cost have just skyrocketed. So I think the evidence is accumulating. Um, but I don't think we're getting the message out uh, from the scientific community to the decision makers in a way that it's easy for them to understand. You know, the, um, the Congress in my country, in the United States, they don't read PLOS Pathogen, where I publish my article. They just don't read that. So hence why I go to the Huffington Post, where you have to reach the decision makers in a different way. You have a nice system in Europe where you have EFSA generating that kind of science and then you have the EU implementing policy and managing the management or reducing the risk. Um, so I, I think as we build those connections, we're gonna, we'll start to see it come together. But it takes a much broader discussion. I think Tommaso was also getting that too. How do you engage the end users up front um, in the science so they're, they're an integral part to, to use it ultimately? But I think we're growing more examples of building in the cost, the health cost, um, and clearly being able to demonstrate, we have a big project with palm oil in Malaysia right now, and we're adding in the infectious disease cost of palm oil, and it's starting to become very relevant. 
but local decision makers never had access to that information, so they've never really even thought about it, in all fairness to them. I think um, um, land use is one of the things, and its effect on, say, tick vectors is one of the things we don't really know very much about. So uh, I had a PhD student who was trying to model the landscape suitability in the UK for high loma marginatum establishing. And it's actually quite difficult to do because you don't ne really know what the effects are in terms of irrigation or pesticides or ploughing of agricultural land for the suitability of this tick. So. Uh, I suppose before you start thinking about doing a policy, it's a good idea to try and understand exactly how different landscapes do affect uh, not only different vectors, but also wildlife in general. You have to think about maybe the rabbits and the hares, because maybe rabbits will, uh, create a habitat that isn't quite right for that tick, whereas hares create a habitat that is right. Um, so these are some of the sort of problems we face before we start thinking about policy. Because if you make a change in one area <coughs> to meet a policy, uh, you don't know what the other effects are in other areas, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. Um, th I mean, there, there, there are ways of doing this in terms of scientifically, but as you said, it's hard to make the decision in terms of, I mean, e ecosystem services as a way that you can look at these multiple services that you get from an agro ecosystem. And in, in this case, actually, you're talking about a disservice in terms of the the service of changing the landscape to provide f um, food and fuel at the same time is, ch is, is creating adverse services in some other capacity is what you're talking about. And there are attempts to actually put values on those. The problem is that uh, who gains and who wins depends on which service you're looking at. And that, so therefore, economically, you can begin to put these calculations forward. But it's ultimately a decision maker that makes those trade-offs and those ultimate decisions. So for instance, when ecosystem services um, came in, one of the very early things to do was obviously put value on trees in terms of carbon, which was relatively easy to do. And then you had some countries in the world saying, the trees are only worth money to us if we chop them down and send them off. But we understand they're worth X to the world if we leave them there, who's paying? Uh, and and that's, a, a, that's a really tricky um, situation. So I, I, I think, um, there are ways of doing this, but you need to kind of think carefully about it. And, and, and a classic example is the big drive, somewhat philosophical, towards sustainable intensification. But if you look at the word sustainable intensification, it very much focuses in on the increased production per unit area without uh, an effect on the environment. But it says without an effect on the environment, and there's not a lot of much attention on that angle in the same way as there is, how do you get more broilers being produced per unit area? I think we can take the next question from the lady over there. I would like to have a comment uh, almost from uh, all of you all about the problem of the unknown pathogens that uh, Dr. Bayliss uh, talked about because either uh, uh, the predictive models the disease management, I think also in plant health and everything, or either also the impairing uh, the pathway, common pathway for all pathogens, are obviously barely the four pathogens that are known, but uh, there are uh, the possibility, and the Smallenberg virus is an example of a new pathogens that we don't know in advance. So how can we deal with these unknown pathogens? Well, it, it's a good question, and um, I believe in evolution, so I think that we'll always have new pathogens. Even if we erase all the pathogens on the planet today, we'll wait a few weeks and there'll be new ones. So that's why I think we need to, and I, this was a, th a theme of the talks here, that, that we need to focus maybe a little bit less on, or, or equally at least, on the threats that are there right now and where the new threats might be coming from in the future. And we should maybe even forget about the pathogens a little bit. We should think more about the, the uh, future modes of transmission, the ways that people interact with their environment, the, how drivers will create opportunities for pathogens that we imagine that may not even be around today. Uh, otherwise, and I, I don't know if this will translate, but we'll be playing whack-a-mole 
you know, this game where you try to hit, hit the mole and another one pops up. We'll just keep going from pathogen to pathogen with a, you know, a new vaccine and a new therapeutic. And that will be terrible. It will just keep costing money. So if we can find common uh, universal ways of stopping transmission in the first place, that might be more economically um, efficient. I would absolutely agree that prevention is always better than, than cure. But um, I think one of the other things that we need to make sure is that we have in place monitoring and surveillance systems that allows us to pick these things up rapidly. And this is where the event-based surveillance movement becomes important. Some of the traditional systems are based around you looking for what you know exists. And so you'll never detect the emerging pathogen. But some of the syndromic-based surveillance systems, some of the event-based surveillance systems, gives us a degree of reassurance that if there was to be a radically new uh, infection arise, we would be able to detect it. So I think part of that is I agree with the colleague that actually we need, we need to find ways of preventing this happening, avoiding it happening. But we also need to make sure that we have in place the monitoring and surveillance systems that allow us to detect such things rapidly. Yes, one thing's for sure is that um, new pathways will keep evolving as well. And I think it'd be quite interesting to try and ascertain what percentage of pathways do we actually know at the moment. We've looked at what percentage of viruses do we know. Uh, and also consider ways in which those pathways may change in the future. Because we're, we're going to get modifications of old pathways, uh, but we also get new pathways and things we haven't even thought about at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so the money, of course, you know, you have to follow the money. And so the, our traditional approach of one bug, one drug, and all the money is in the pharmacy, you know, make, you make a lot of money if you develop the newest drug for the newest disease or the new vaccine. So the money is one bug, one drug. There's not a lot of profit to be made in controlling and reducing disease, you know, diseases or preventing them. You know, there's no company making lots of money on prevention. So it, that gets to more of a whole of society approach, which Tommaso was getting to too. So where, um, what's the benefits to society? How much money do we save? But it comes from a, you have to think like the World Bank or the finance minister once again. Where's the, you know, the real cost? Because if you segment it um, out, as was just already said, there's money to be made or where do you put the investment? And I think we have this false dichotomy too about um, investing in prevention or investing in response. Um, and that's a debate that shouldn't happen. We have to have both of those, of course. Um, Larry Brilliant says that outbreaks are inevitable and pandemics are optional. So we're gonna have outbreaks, but they don't have to be pandemics. I would add that the number of outbreaks is also optional. So we can reduce them. So the disease response group is not so overwhelmed that they can't get anything done. And we have a whole of society example in this room. If you look at the ceiling, we have smoke detectors. Um, fire prevention is not owned by the fire department. Health is not owned by the Ministry of Health. Health is owned by us, the public. And we have an all society approach to fire prevention. We start with children having education. Engineers design this carpet so it's less flammable. The building was designed so it doesn't all burn down. So we have policies, we have regulations, we have engineers involved in fire. We have educators involved in fire prevention. We have early warning systems built into systems like that. And then we still have good fire departments that go put out the fire when they do happen. So we need all of those across society. And I think we need to rethink what health really is um, instead of chasing diseases. Thank you. A, ve a very brief comment, if I may. Inspired by inflammable carpets. I believe the, the, there is one obvious equivalent in the world of livestock production. That's the use of antimicrobials as feed additives to make the animals grow faster still. That is highly inflammable. <laughs> I, I have a question before we go back to the audience. Um, much of what we've uh, heard about um, is um, perhaps uh, relatively rare events, but, but people fear them. Um, 
many of the issues those of us involved in uh, food safety have to deal with are perhaps relatively common events which are less feared, i.e. campylobacter and stuff like that. I, I just wondered, in terms of those high frequency things like campylobacter, salmonella, etc., you know, what we can learn from your kind of, shall we say, more natural evolutionary systems which might be very useful for bringing f across into the very kind of frequent things we see on a daily basis. I think that's too hard a question for us. Uh, <laughs> Well, I suppose um, food safety is a bit like the water industry. I used to work in that, and it's all about identifying the barriers and having a multiple barriers system. Uh, because one thing that came out of the horizon scanning workshop on the mathematical side is that humans are not very good at nonlinear relationships. And uh, I think it's Professor Roland Kao um, gave the example of the broken arrow example when a plane with a nuclear bomb crashed in, I think it was North Carolina and five of the six safety mechanisms had actually failed. And we don't understand that sort of mechanism. So maybe from the pathogens which are more common, if we can understand the safety factors and the barriers better, then we can apply them to these rare events so that they become more rare. Um, I suppose that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. And I think we can take another question from the audience. There's some question over there in the back. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Huub Notenbaum from the Dutch Food Authority and also a member of the scientific panel of EFSA. You all know that we uh, struggle more than 10 years with emerging issues. And I'm coming back to the title drivers. I saw a very nice ranking of drivers of indicator and I would like to have the opinion of the panel should we measure these drivers should we erect a system in place to be a little bit more proactive so I'm not talking about outbreak management so before that because that is really you could help us as the experts because that is a there's a key question within EFSA because we have an emerging risk unit but you showed again a long list of climate change, uh, industrial changes, bushmeat. Should we make a surveillance system for this? Or is it already done? And where could we pick it? Or could we look at it? I hope I'm, hope I'm clear for this. Well, I have a feeling we'll have lots to say about that together. But, um, so my opinion is yes, we should look more carefully at the drivers, but I don't think that's the hard part. I think the hard part is the question of scale. At what scale do we look at these drivers? Do we look at them globally? Do we look at them locally? Do we look at them immediately? Do we look at, at what time horizon do we look at them? Because really, uh, we, we know, I, I can predict right now, I, I, I predict that flu will emerge next year somewhere probably from Asia. I predict that there will be a pandemic with origins in Africa at some point in the future. So it's not so much, and, and I predict it will be linked to bushmeat or linked to de de deforestation. So it's not so much identifying the drivers as understanding, as being able to do so on a scale that's truly useful for public health. And that unfortunately depends on politics and policy, what, what we want to get out of it, what, what our aim is, what type of time horizon and geographic range do we want. So I think it's, it's more of a policy question in some senses than a scientific one. Um, I think I tried to make the point in, um, in my presentation that uh, there's a very good uh, analysis a study that's been done uh, looking at the drivers of uh, events, uh, disease events in humans uh, that both Bill and I took uh, data from. Um, but I tried to make the point that I think it's more complex than that. Uh, very few examples where these things can be pinned down to a uh, single driver. And in particular, for the purposes of this meeting, you know, which is EFSA, so we're interested in food, 
food animals and plants. I think what we're really interested in is the drivers of the emergence of diseases into plants and into food animals rather than the, spi the zoonotic spillover, let's say, into humans. And I think that's a piece of work that really hasn't been done uh, by anybody in great detail. I think it'd be very complex, but well worth doing so that we can then, from that perspective, from both food plants and food animals, what are the really important drivers for the emergence of diseases into them? And then maybe we can do what you're suggesting in terms of tackling those drivers, perhaps. I, I do think there's some great opportunities right now, actually, for policy implications. So the World Bank is now just reviewing its environmental and social guidelines for what the bank will fund in development projects. So I we remember um, you used the word change five times in your question. Um, and it's about change. So in all those drivers, it's about the change in food industry. It's about the change in land use. Um, so we can identify where that's happening and what thing, you know, so we know kind of where. Um, and we know probably who's funding that. Um, so there's an opportunity. We just pushed with the World Bank. They've never included zoonotic disease or infectious diseases in their environment and social standards. It's not in there at all. So it's open to public comment, and there's an opportunity to get that inserted in bank financing, which trickles down to country financing, um, and private industry side of it, too. There's an insurance component, so we could require um, disease spillover event contamination insurance by the companies that are producing it. Well, that adds the cost. But if they, cer they follow certain guidelines, their insurance policy price goes down. So there's a, some mechanisms that we can use to drive this forward. It's not going to be resolved this year, but if we're thinking about a 10-year horizon, we can do a lot of things to just reduce risk. Um, we can't eliminate risk, we can reduce risk. If I may briefly add to that, uh, I believe a discussion about drivers is a bit risky because it, it starts looking like spaghetti. It's difficult to compartmentalize it. I believe what does help, though, is to um, make a distinction between three um, host domains. We've got people, we've got livestock, and we've got uh, natural ecosystems with wildlife. Why does it help? Because in each of these domains, uh, microbes behave different, also the pathogens, of course, and the way we manipulate microbes also is far different for each of these domains. Just one Example, take for example, if we deal with natural ecosystems, uh, deforestation springs to the eye. We have seen a shift in deforestation from Latin America to Asia, whilst most of the deforestation in Africa is yet to come. I'm just trying to suggest that we look at the drivers for these separate host domains. If I could just very briefly make comment, two comments. Um, you talked about monitoring, which to me sounds like surveillance, and a, and a, and a, you know, a principal surveillance is it's information for action. So yes, do it if we're clear what the trigger point is for action. Uh, the other observation I'd make is that perhaps that's not the issue here. We have a lot of evidence that's already been presented. There are many case studies in, in, in human medicine where the evidence for action was clear, but it took 10 years or more for that to follow. So let's look at the evidence for the use of anti-thrombolytic -thromb therapy for the management of acute myocardial infarction. The evidence there was 10 years there before actually it became built into policy. So it may be that we should make, we should make effective use of what we know already, but monitoring, we need to be clear what the trigger points would be for any further or new action. Thank you very much for those reactions and discussions. We are at the clock of one o'clock, and I see, I've seen there are a lot of questions still, and I think we could go on until about uh, two o'clock or maybe three o'clock with this discussion. It's very interesting and very fruitful. But we have to draw the line here, I guess. And I want to make a few comments on what uh, this discussion has, uh, has yielded. The first thing I notice <laughs> is that um, the, um, to get a grip on these drivers for emerging issues in animal and plant health. The concept of uh, pathway is central. And 
<coughs> to, um, to, to reduce the, um, the outbreaks and to reduce the emergence of animal pests and diseases and plant health and plant pests and diseases. The uh, a disruption of the pathway somehow is necessary. But that doesn't make life easier right away because a pathway is a very complex thing. It starts in, at the origin and there's a complex ecology at the origin which may be disrupted by humans in many ways. The pathway itself, the movement is complex. And also at the reception site, there is a complex ecology which is disrupted by human interventions. And the pest may react differently in the place of origin and in the place of destination. So it requires a, a, a broader, a wider view on, on ecological aspects and of genetical aspects and of population dynamics aspects and the way uh, uh, the human uh, culture and agriculture interferes with this. But the, 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 this requires a new concept and the concept has been formulated this morning in the presentations and the discussions and that's very a fruitful um, yield of this, of this meeting. Another thing is that um, in order to get a grip on drivers, we all agree that they should be measured somehow, but at the same, um, for the same reasons, measuring drivers is just as difficult as getting a grip on the pathways. And the same, um, the same arguments and the same aspects should be brought into this, this approach. And well, I could, I could say a lot more, but I want to fin finally say that um, with all this information, it is also necessary, sorry, to have a good response system in place, a control center, which may be a, a, a global control center for, for, the, for the really strong cases, but could be a regional control center for the, for the lesser cases. And we, uh, lessons have been presented from uh, the human uh, communication, communicative diseases, how to, uh, how to establish a control center for that, which may serve as an inspiration for a control center for animal and plant health control. Um, well, these are my uh, observations from the cuff. Maybe, uh, Guy, you want to add something to that? No, other than you've all got lots of work to do because there's lots of ideas now. So I, I wish you well in trying to uh, take forward lots of the great ideas that have come forward today. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, <coughs> I share those uh, thanks and I especially want to, uh, to thank all the, the speakers for their contributions and for their insights in the discussions and the audience for the, for the questions. And sorry that we could not bring every question into discussion. But nevertheless, thank you very for your attention and your contributions.